okay? I grew up on a dairy farm myself. And what did we do? When we had a cow that was a good milk producer, we saved her heifer calves, right? Pretty basic. If we had a cow that had all kinds of health problems, even though she was a good milker, but she had all kinds of health problems, maybe mastitis, and various, of, all, all kinds of things that can pop up on a dairy farm. We didn't keep her heifer calves. We sold them, got rid of them. If we had a cow that wanted to take your head off every time you sit down and try to milk her, we didn't keep her calf either. <laughs> you, know, I don't, you know, I didn't like being kicked every time, you know. My dad didn't either. And so, yeah, we sold them. You know, the calves, you know, and maybe even the cow. That's not what you want to promote. And then down the road, that's really going to pay off for you. You're not going to have sick bees. And that's where you want to get to. Just like when we were on the farm, we lowered our incidence of health problems by selecting from the healthy mother mother cows. And uh, it works. And you just got to keep working at it. You can't probably get it overnight or a year, but it will work. And when you continue to work at it, it will, it will go and, and work and do better. Um, Naturally, wintering uh, capabilities is an important factor. Obviously, <laughs> if they don't make it through the winter, they're, you know, they're not going to be in your breeding program. But if you, uh, you know, in the spring, you've got a little tiny cluster, and it takes them forever to build up and get going, you probably lost some honey flow time because they weren't enough uh, numbers in there to, uh, you know, to make the honey for you. It's probably not a queen you want to select to breed from. Uh, so there, you know, there's and there's other factors that you kind of got to look to. Maybe it was an extremely harsh winter, blah blah blah. You know those kinds of things. But for a general run, if, if they didn't come through the winter real good and didn't start out in the spring, busting and going after it, then she's probably not a good candidate to be breeding from. And if anybody has questions, wants to say, please throw something at me or whatever. It's Where's my three queens? They're in your hive. We combine them into one, so you got one big one. <laughs> Honey and pollen yeah. production. Naturally, we're all looking, or most of us are looking for honey production. And uh, so we're going to choose a queen or a hive that produces the most honey or close to the most honey. And I'll, I'd really like to caution you, if you have more than one bee yard, all right, you've got bee yard A, B, and C, all right? Bee yard A, this hive produces four supers of honey for you, all right? Yard B, this one produces five supers of honey. And C, this one produces six supers of honey for you. You'd say, okay, this one produces six supers of honey, so that's the best queen I've got. Not necessarily, because the, the, the honey areas vary, and the nectar availability varies. So it could be that in yard A, this is a very, very good queen, although she only produced four supers of extra honey. But there was not a lot of a, a nectar available for her her bees to work on. So she could very well be the best queen that you've got. So you've got to kind of balance these things out. And, and you can't just look at, you know, one and say she's the best, period. You know, you've got to look at other factors, availability of nectar and, and all those types of things. There's there's areas where you put a bee yard and the nectar source is just not very good. And you can have the best queen in the world if you don't have a good nectar source, you're not, you know, there's nothing she can do about it. You just can't manufacture, you know, you just can't manufacture nectar, period, you know. So you've got to look at, at other things that are out there as well. Uh, if you're raising pollen and, and selling some pollen, that's another factor. That's another way to add income to yourself. You can collect the pollen and sell it. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of the people that want bee pollen. And they'll pay good money for it. 
And so some bees collect more pollen than others. I have seen hives that have been absolutely uh, pollen bound, as I call it, and, and because they collected you know, excess pollen. And then other hives that don't have very much pollen in them at all. So if you're if you're wanting to do pollen, then naturally you want to select that queen that comes from a hive that's got pollen bound, so I speak, so to speak, because she'll do more. You know, we'll make more pollen that way for you. So that's the best thing that you can you know look at. And and again, the areas are different. So if you've got different yards, you've got to look at the, the, the sources there as well. Hygienic behavior. This is probably the most important, I think, in a way, one of the most important aspects to look at. Uh, we have found, they've done a lot of studies like in the 40s and 50s when American fowl brood was pretty rampant all across the United States. And they, what they did, they took, some of the queen breeders would take 20 to 30 to 40 hives put them out in an isolated area by themselves and they would literally take a frame that was infested with American fowl brood and they would put one in each one of those hives. Go off and leave it. Do nothing. No treatment, no nothing. Just go off and leave it. They come back in a few months and there may be you know, three hives alive maybe five, maybe one, whatever the case may be. But generally speaking, there'll be some survivors. Why did they survive American fowl brood when all the others died? Well, later we've come to find out that hygienic behavior is, plays a big role in that. They actually take the American fowl brood out becomes, before it becomes full-blown in spores, and millions and millions of spores going everywhere. So the hygienic behavior is a big part of that. They didn't know it at the time, back in the 40s and 50s. The only thing they knew was that they survived. They started breeding from those queens, using those queens for breeders. American foundries started going down in incidents in the United States. Very simple, not rocket science, but just breeding from that. How do you tell if your bees are hygienic behavior or not? There's, uh, a few things you can do. This is a simple soup can. I've cut both top and bottom out of it. You can take and actually embed this on a frame that, that has cap root. Embed it down in there and pour liquid nitrogen in there to freeze that cap root. Freeze it just a few seconds, it'll freeze and whatever. You take your, your can off, put it back in your hive, and 24 to 48 hours, you come back and take it back out and look. And if the bees have took out 95% of the brood that was frozen in there, you've got a really good hygienic hive. So it's a simple way of doing it. Not, maybe not so simple because liquid nitrogen is not that uh, easy to find. And it's a little, uh, little, little difficult cold. to work with, a little dangerous, but not as bad as most people think it is. But it is, uh, you've got to be careful and you've got to know what you're doing. But uh, that's the way the pros do it. That's the way the queen breeders, the good ones, test their, their bees and their queens with. And that's what they do most of the time. Um, there are other things that are available. Um, you can do the same thing in a freezer and then take plugs from a frozen frame of capped brood and put a plug of brood in, you can do, yes, you can in do the that. frame if you don't want to mess with the liquid nitrogen. Right. But yeah. would do the same thing, it be as any, any probably uh, most product that it's not really toxic to the bees that would kill the brood yeah. under there under the cap would probably work you know as well and be okay. Uh, but it wouldn't be as dangerous to the bees. I mean, if you, if you get it under the hands, it'll still give you cold burn, but it's not dangerous if you inhale it. Yeah. How about the middle one? What about poking the cat brood with a needle? Didn't they? Haven't they done that some? Just they it takes more time some, to poke them with a needle and then check to see. Uh, some of the oh. studies say that the, that when you prick it or push a little hole in it, that's a different 
mechanism that the bees take them out. So it's a different gene, so to speak, and it's not really the gene that you're looking for for a hygienic. It, it is in a way, but it's, it's not the same. So they, what I've read is that it's not quite as good as the, like the li liquid nitrogen or freezing it for the hygienic behavior. But I'm sure it has a good indication of, uh, of how your bees are going are to handle something like that. Yeah. Uh, my partners in crime in West Virginia, as we always talk about, there's about three of us down there that, that work together quite often. And uh, our buddy Wade has a neighborhood of 150 to 175 hives or so. And he's, he's quite in, innovative and does a lot of things. What he done is one of the things that he's come up with. This is just plain old roll of shop towels from the auto parts place, the, the blue towels. And uh, he cuts them in little squares about this size right here. Okay? And uh, then he takes food grade mineral oil, which you can buy at Walmart or you can buy at some of the farms places as well for, for cattle uh, that have indigestion and things of that nature. Uh, it's, it's totally harmless to you, totally harmless to the bees. As a matter of fact, it's good for the bees because uh, they say this, get this oil on them, you get rid of some of the trachea mites and varroa mites. So it's, it's, it's an oil treatment as well. And what he does is soak these little, little pads in the uh, mineral oil and occasionally he'll put some other, uh, like this is patchola, peppermint, or, or essential oil, just enough to put a little smell in there. But you don't have, really have to do that as well. Take, once you got it saturated, take and put it right on top of the brood chamber, on top of the frames, put everything back together. And if you come back in two or three weeks, it's gone, it's a good hive. That'll be one of your better honey producers. We've, we've really watched this over several years. This is not just a fluke thing. We've watched it over several years. If you come back and it's laying there and they haven't really touched it, say in three weeks, it's just laying there, it's kind of dried out some, they haven't taken any of it out to mount anything. That hive will not produce very much honey. We just found it. I mean, there may be an exception to the case, but that's what we generally find, that those hives aren't very productive. So we mark them as requeen and get rid of them. But so you're saying the whole thing will be gone? Yeah, the whole thing will be gone. Totally, gone. totally be gone. Yeah, they'll rip it up and you'll find it laying out in front. And that's what you want to see. When you see that, you've got a hygienic hive and it will work. Is this scientific? I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> what we have we have watched it and we've we've kept an eye on the hives and we've always always found that the ones that take it out the fastest are the best producers. And uh, so, you know, I, it, it, and it, it's it's inexpensive and it's not going to hurt the bees and it's not going to hurt you. It's totally yes sir. What do you think of putting mineral oil in your smoker? You smoke them, you know, it has a little bit of that mineral oil in it. A man in Tennessee told me that that's what they did down there to deal with the mites. That I may be a mite uh, 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 to deal with the mites. I don't know. I couldn't <clears throat> answer to that. I've never tried it. Uh, maybe Dr. Two might, uh, he's not here. But so, uh, it may work, it may not work. I don't know, just to be honest with you. I, I have no idea. But it shouldn't cause any problems because mineral oil is, is very safe. You know, we take it for medicine and, and they use it in cattle for medicine. And, you know, so it's, I like using safe stuff. <laughs> I don't really like using stuff that causes cancer and, and, or kills my bees, you know. And uh, so the more safer stuff that I, that I can get a hold of, the, the better I'm going to like it. And, uh, so, but that's that's just a couple of things that, that we have found and deal with and try to uh, to evaluate hygienic behavior. What's but, the time? What's the time frame for removing the two to three weeks on the little pads? Yeah. If you come back in two or three weeks and they're gone, that's a good time frame. And uh, sometimes they'll get them faster than that. 
but uh, generally we try to go go around about every three weeks or so and look at the bees, put it in, we come back in three weeks, and if it's gone, it's gone, you know, and we we'll go from there. Can you do that in the spring? You can do it most any time. Yeah. But in spring we do it in spring a lot. But you can do it in midsummer, you can do it if you've got if you've gotten swarms or you made splits and you know during the summer you can pop it in there. They should be the winter time of course not gonna bother, but any any of the warm you know, when it's warm time, they should take it out. Okay. Queen size. I think Dan talked a little bit about the big queen. You know, and I'm all five foot four. I take exception to the big queen. You know what I mean? Hey, I wish the queen was anybody else, let me tell you. <laughs> it's not fair to us little guys, let me tell you. You know, it's always there. You know, my legs go from my to the floor just like anybody else's. Uh, but no, seriously, uh, all kidding aside, I have to surrender to this. The larger the queen, the better she's going to be. I really believe that. She'll have more. Uh, I went too far here. Okay. She's going to have more uh, tubes to lay more eggs, and 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 so she's going to do a better job for a longer period of time. So if you find little queen cells when you're when you're making queens, just cut them off. Don't even worry about it. Just it's part of life, you know. Whatever. Uh, maybe that's what my mother should have done with me. I don't know. But, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We're all just supposed to be stuck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it, uh, you know, look for the bigger ones. You got me off here now. Uh, <laughs> she also will have a larger spermatheca, so she can can have more sperm. So she should, at that point, be able to last longer than a smaller queen with a smaller sperm and thicket. Wouldn't it be nice if our queens would be able to run four years instead of one or two and produce just as well and lay just as many eggs and all that kind of thing? We wouldn't have to replace her as much. It would be hard on the queen raisers, but it's going to be a, you know, a better thing. And, uh, so, again, the larger, bigger, full body queen, the better things are going to be for you. Of course, there's always the little runt, like myself, that will skew the marketplace. But, again, this, I think, will have more to do with sometimes the, the, the race of bee will, will make a difference. Italian bees, for instance, are traditionally known for a big queen. And, you know, uh, Cardinalians are a little bit smaller, not much anymore. They're getting bigger all the time as well because the selection trait is going more and more that way, of course. Uh, but if any of you, uh, I'm 65 years old, and when I was uh, growing up on the farm, we had the old German black bees. If any of you, anyone remember the old German black bees in here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I heard a yes. My grandpa. Yeah, okay. Uh, they were small. And the queens were small. And they were a good bee. And they produced lots of honey and, and everything like that. But daggone, they would follow you from the bee yard to the house, back to the barn, and back to the house again. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they, they were about, I think they were the first Africanized bees ever. I mean, <laughs> They were they were just just absolutely fearless, and uh, you didn't want to you, you know you didn't want to get the gravely out in the in the, in the uh, <laughs> garden if you had those around because here they come, uh, you know, and, and horses and cattle and stuff they'd run them off. And they were just honored. They were just absolutely honored. But they were good bees, and they were smaller bees. So there's always exceptions. But I think it's general rule: go with the bigger ones and cut the small ones out and let them go. Just get rid of them. You don't see them anymore? You? No, you don't see the Germans anymore. Uh, haven't, there, was a, there was a place in Tennessee that was advertising the German Queens, uh, but I haven't seen it for the last three or four years, so I don't know if they've gone out of business or what. 
but they were they, more susceptible to EFD, I think. Uh huh. Yeah, they were. Uh, yeah, I think you're right there. Uh, but I think the biggest problem with them is people got tired of them being so honest. <laughs> so they just uh, chose to go a different direction, and, and they, they fell out of favor because of their honoriness. And, uh, you know, it's just, it just, you can't. You may be able, you might be able to get on the internet and Google and find them. I don't know. Again, defensive behavior is very important to work with. Uh, you don't, you know, I don't like to go into bees. And they're just continually bouncing off my veil and flying all around and finding, you know, finding ways, inventive ways to sting you, you know. And then again, like I say, follow you to the house, the barn, back to the house again. And uh, if you've got neighbors very close or animals very close when you're working with bees, uh, you know, something to consider. Uh, they're not, uh, you know, the more aggressive bees are not the best ones to breed from. And I tend to stay away from it. If you've got 20 hives in apiary, you're always, almost always going to find one that's going to be more ornery than the rest of them. But again, you've got to look at everything. You know, uh, if you go in just one time or whatever and they get real aggressive with you, uh, maybe they're not that aggressive. And maybe it's, you know, if there's a major uh, thunderstorm coming in, my bees are always, almost always mad. You know, they know when, even though you can't see it here, or I can't see it here, they can, obviously, and they're just a little more prickly when when the storm's coming in. So, you know, you gotta got to look at those kinds of things as well. I had someone last night that said that uh, they had, that their bees were, were pretty ornery and whatever. Uh, I, have, I have found if you take your shirt that you've been wearing and sweating in and get it good and smelly, and, and particularly if you've got a long sleeve shirt, and put it on a hanger and hang it like near the entrance of, of that mean hive, it may calm it down. I've done that before, and it did. They got used to the size and shape of your body. They got the smell off of it, and eventually, they every time they came out, they looked at it. Yeah, yeah, that's the same old thing, and you know, and they quit being so aggressive towards people. Yes, sir. I've heard that they've been able to breed bees that are so gentle you can kick the box around, no smoke, and they won't sting you. But you had to feed them or else they'd starve. How do you weight the different aspects of defensive behavior? You know, if I've got a hive that will produce an extra five boxes of honey, but they're just a little bit meaner or, you know, they've got you know, mildly susceptible to chalk brood, if they outperform in other areas, how do you weight everything out? To, you know, that's a good. That's are, are you going to pick a? Are you going to raise queens off of a hive with a big fat queen, or one with a little skinny queen that produces an extra couple boxes of honey? You know, how do you balance out everything to decide what's the most important? That's your decision. You're going to have to weigh yourself, and that comes with experience and whatever. Myself, if I have a hive that has chalk brood in it, I don't care how much honey they produce. I'm not going to raise queens. For I just, I just don't, I just write her off the market because that's a health problem or whatever. Now, if I've got a smaller queen that's really producing lots of bees and doing a fine job, lots of honey, I may raise, I may raise some queens for her. Yes, but when it comes to a health problem, I don't do it. But you may want to. I mean, I, I'm not saying you should. You know, that's a, that's a choice. Well, I always heard, you know, a good overall do. rule is just. The strongest overwintered colonies in early spring, the strongest colonies are going to make you the most honey, and you know that's a good general rule to look at. Good rule to look the at. healthiest, but defensively, uh, you know, where do you draw the line to throw them out is, is a personal choice. Uh, I have, I have, we have beekeepers in our association that have the Russian bees, and they're pretty dang on honey uh, for the most part. They love them. They wouldn't change for the world. And I wouldn't ask, you know, nobody should ask them to change. You know, that's fine. I don't particularly like that hot of a bee, so I'm going to go the other direction and I may go too far. But, you know, it's going to be your choice to make. If you're fine with them being a little aggressive and being honoring, then, then that's fine. But I will say that probably if you get to the point where you're selling queens, 
you're probably not going to want to sell those those Andre or Queens because most people most people want a nice calm quiet bee that's not going to chase you to the house. Uh, you know that's but again it, it's it's your choice. You're doing you're going to I can't tell you per se. You know you're just going to have to kind of work that out for yourself. I think it's like you have to know your market if you're selling to like urban beekeepers then of course you want to make sure you're selling them a passive, yeah. less defensive fee. You, you know. And I think it makes the difference whether they'll come back and buy that second queen. Exactly. Yeah. You know, if they like their hive and they're happy with it, then they'll come back again. And if they think it's <clears throat> more aggressive than what they wanted, they'll go to somebody else. Exactly. You're, you hit the nail on the head right there. Where some people are looking for the production and they don't mind a little more aggressive Com fee. Commercial producers don't really mind it. But most of our market is going to be the hobbyist, and, and we're not in you know the commercial end of it. I have uh, we have a friend that's passed away now. Uh, it had 11 supers of honey. Wow. And I took the supers off, and the bees were just as nice as they could be. It was a Canadian Buckfast queen. It's been several years ago, and it truly had 11 supers on it. And the bees were just as nice and gentle as they could be. So gentle bees can produce honey as well, you know, and they do produce honey as well. They don't have to be mean to be the best honey producer. And breeding bees isn't a one-shot deal, and, and sometimes you select for a trait. The, the bee has at least one trait that you like. There may be traits that you don't like, but then you, you cross it. You, you raise the drones from a colony that of gentle bees, then you, you made it with the ordinary bee that, that produces good honey, and you you try to balance it out. Balance it out and get the get the honey production from the from the one source of genes and the and the gentleness from the other source of genes, and, and it may or may not work, but it's not a one shot deal. So uh, you, you have to you have to consider all of them, and, and maybe there's traits that you don't like, but then you work on breeding those traits out and, and try to emphasize the traits that you do like. It's a, it's a whole new whole science of genetic breeding. And uh, Joe Latchall from here in Ohio is one of the most knowledgeable people on that that I, I know of. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe you know, there could be a class or something done. And he's done it in the past. Uh, I'm not a, a genetics breeder, you know, all these kinds of things to, to get there. But, but Joe is, and he'd be an excellent speaker. And, some of them listen to on that particular program. Does the bill much breeding in Ohio with uh, Buckfast strains? Uh, I really don't know. I'm from West Virginia, and so I don't know. Um, West, Virginia. Uh, West Virginia, yeah, we brought in in our queen producers some some Canadian Buckfast. Uh, now we've found that the Danish uh, side of the Buckfast we haven't had very much success with at all, and I really couldn't recommend them. But the, the old line, Buckfast. That's uh, unless it's like half Italian, half English, or something like that. Well, you know, the Buckfast is a mongrel. Right. You know, Brother Adam just gathered in from all over the world and mixed and matched and, and kept mixing and matching and, until he came come with the quote, quote, the Buckfast. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, that's basically what a Buckfast is. It's a mongrel. Is that that guy from Texas uh, sells those Buckfasts? that you're talking about, the Canadian, or <coughs> something no. different? Okay. Uh, he, mm -hmm. I don't know. His is not Canadian, but fast. There's um, a guy in Texas, though. Yeah. I've seen it online. Right. Uh, uh, Weaver. Five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, this, I'm about to run out of time here. Let's move up a little bit. Robber bees. Uh, this may, may not be a problem for you, but uh, that, sometimes bees are just more apt to rob than others. Yeah, Italians. And, and, and they, they, they irritate me. You know, when I go into my apiary and I open up a hive and oh, here come the robbers, you know, and, and it just drives me up the wall. It may not bother you, but to me it bothers me and I don't like it. So when I catch a hive that's excessive robbers, um, you know, and they wipe out a, a, maybe a, a nuke or something really that you're trying to get started, all those kinds of things, I, I kicked them out of my breeding program. You may want to leave them in there, uh, but that's, you know, again, your choice. 
Uh, runner queens. Uh, that's another uh, problem for you. When, you, when you're looking for a queen and, and she's running all over the, and bouncing and jumping and going from the hunt, every corner that she can find, she's a lot harder to find. Maybe if she's a great queen, oh, and good production and no health problems, <coughs> yeah, I'm going to leave her alone. But you know, uh, if I've got a choice between two, I'm going to check. I'm going to take the queen that's calmer on the, on the plane, doesn't run around as much, and uh, at, at another kind of a personal kind of thing. Winter consumption. Uh, I think we've all probably read uh, the, the studies that. The Italian race, the Italians use more honey during the winter for winter consumption than some of the others do, like the Carnarvons and whatever. So that's a thing to consider when you're when you're working with your queens as well. Um, you know, you may have you, you may have one that uses 60 pounds during the winter, and you may have one that uses 80 pounds during the winter, and uh, you might want to you know, breed from the one that uses 60. Uh, you know, and, and you got to look at all factors too. The one that's using 60 during the winter may have produced 100 during the summer excess for you. So you're actually coming out ahead uh, by using her over the one that only uses 40 pounds because she made a lot more honey during the summer. So you got to, you know, you got to look at a lot of factors. There, okay? And that's my email address, phone number. If you have questions or anything of that nature, uh, we'll be doing the cell punch this afternoon. And uh, please give me an email or a call, help me in any way I can.